Hey everybody, it is Winter Mutant coming to you from the Think Tank, and today we're going to talk about Japan and its technologies in version 4. Now, Japan's in an awkward position where it could use just about any technology it gets, but it's not going to get that many. Um, Japan has the, uh, pound for pound, probably the second worst tech program in the game, Italy being number one. Uh, and even if you factor in Russia having several turns where it can't roll, as soon as it does roll, it can make up a diff the difference pretty quickly uh, with, uh, with one factory upgrade. And then depending on whether the Molotov or Rootop pack is signed, they can get up to five rolls real quick and, and, catch and play catch up pretty quickly. Japan, though, starts off with one die. That's it. One die, one tech die. And then they can upgrade one factory uh, uh, down here for six bucks right away to start getting a, a second tech die on the next turn and that's probably it that's all you're probably going to get unless you really invest in another f major factory and of course you're going to be investing in that major factory from the ground up so yeah that that's quite an investment and i'm not saying that's good or bad i'm just pointing out that's quite an investment and as japan uh maybe you have a kind of long-term kind of game plan that involves building that extra factory, that other major factory, and and leveraging it in the long term, that extra die and the production capacity of it, uh, to to we you know get your victory, and and, and that's fine. I, I I can I can totally I will absolutely listen to that kind of game plan uh, to to kind of hear it out, but I think for the vast majority of people right now, it's it's that major factory. Then you know they're probably going to upgrade that other one pretty quickly. Just by virtue of, you know, otherwise you're rolling one die a turn, and that's as bad as Italy, which is pretty bad. Um, now, as far as what techs they want. So, I'm going to talk about... Now, I'm going to lump advanced mech, advanced artillery, and heavy armor into kind of... I'm going to talk about them all at once. And it'll make sense why I want to do that here in a second. So, a lot of people do like advanced artillery for Japan... Uh, if you want to beef up your ground war. Now, Japan's in an interesting position where it has to win the ground battles, but so much of its power is at sea. So you can look at it like, okay, well, I want to be more effective in the ground battles to win them more effectively, so I'm going to invest some into kind of uh, ground technologies. Or I'm going to invest in my, my naval uh, to achieve that same effect uh, with, you know, but but my power, the, the benefit will be more naval-based as opposed to uh, ground-based. And so as soon as the units get away from their naval support, uh, things become problematic. Now, of course, there's also the Air Force. So as soon as they, they move out range of the Air Force or my Air Force gets tied up doing something else, uh, you know, do I want my ground force to be able to fight on its own with maybe advanced mech and advanced artillery kind of backing it up kind of a thing? So that is uh, one way to look at it. Another way to, to kind of look at it is these advanced, those three advanced techs, the, the ar heavy armor, advanced artillery, and advanced mech, are also allow you to bring more firepower to bear with a limited transport capacity. And here's what I mean by that. So let's say at any point in the game, Japan has, uh, let's just say right now in this area, they have about five transports. So you can pick up 10 units and drop them wherever you need them. Now, when you pick up those 10 units, one of one on each transport is going to be uh, an infantry class unit of some sort, probably, a let's assume it's a Marine for the most part, for argument's sake. Now, you go, you do an amphibious uh, uh, landing with them, so your five infantry go on first. Now, what do you want to follow up that five infantry? Do you want five advanced artillery, five advanced mech, maybe even five... Uh, heavy armor as opposed to whatever else you have lying around to back them up so in some ways you can look at the upgrading the, the using these advanced units to uh, use those limited slots that you have on transports and put more firepower into each slot with these advanced units so there is some argument to be said for that reason alone why you might want to go for some of those advanced ground units. 
Um, now, the two most obvious choice. Now, the most obvious choice is advanced artillery for you know because it supports infantry. It does have first strike. You know things like that. Although the stats on advanced mech are a little bit better, and of course the stats on a uh, you know advanced armor are just you know through the roof. Um, so yeah, you're going to drop an infantry, and then it would be nice to have it if it's an assault transport land with a heavy armor right next to it. Or if it's not an assault transport, on the f second round, have a heavy armor come on shore, as opposed to a medium armor, maybe at most, or uh, an advanced artillery. So that's that's one way to ki that I, I kind of look at it in, in that sense. And I'm, I'm trying to think outside the box with some of this stuff and try to look at some of these technologies with a, with a fresh view and not try to bring in too many old uh, uh, things from version 3, because I think everything does need a fresh look. Another thing to consider with them is... Um, you know, obviously this is a lot of the, the territory around here. It's, it's very, uh, there's a lot of difficult terrain in the form of jungle, mountain, mountain jungle. Um, there's a lot of coastal regions and things like that. There's a lot of islands, which don't have many, uh, land zones on themselves. So at first glance, it's kind of like, well, do I really need fast moving stuff, move stuff I can move to anyway? Do I need it at all? Well, yeah, there are uses for that. Let's just say, for example, um, you know, well, I mean, th remember that here on the coast from Rihi, well, I, even up here in Manchuria. So for, from central Manchuria all the way down to Hunan, that's all flat area. That's not all mountainous. So if you need to quickly move guys around here, you know, having even just a couple motorized towing some uh, artillery units can be very useful at times, especially if you have the CCP or the KMT in the backfield here starting to get up at Ian and move forward. Well, that gives you some counterattack options. So you can leave the units in a central location like Nanking. Uh, if you're worried that he's going to, if you want from Nanking, you want to be able to hit uh, 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 Kui Chao, Kuang Tung, um, Shentung, Sichuan, you know, and, and, and Ho Pai. That's kind of a centralized location. And so if you've got those faster moving units, and then you have even the advanced versions to, you know, again, bring more firepower to bear in one location. Yeah, there's there's some use for that. There's some use for those fast moving units. Um, even up here, worrying about a Russian counterattack or being up here and kind of going and not telling the Russian player, not signaling the Russian player that you've got uh, movement two units here in Rihi, but then you go one, two, and then suddenly you're in Cheetah. Uh, and, and whatnot. So you're already taking in, taking territory in the Russian backfield or whatever the case may be. So there, there are reasons for Japan to want to have fast moving units. And if you're somebody who does like that, maybe you do want to invest in the advanced mech and, or heavy armor if, if, to really be able to bring some firepower to bear, uh, when the time comes. And actually India is mostly flat in through here. Now, of course there is the desert here. Uh, now, I know this will be a city in the future. Uh, Haryana becomes uh, Delhi, I believe, on the new map. And I don't know whether these these areas have changed in their terrain type. Um, but there are some mountains down here. But, you know, maybe you want to swing around back, drop faster moving units here, and then cut into India that way. So having units that can move too becomes a lot more advantageous in this particular theater. <laughs> Um, now, of course, if Japan's going to attack Russia, you just got a lot of mountains to work through. There's no no two ways about it. You do lose now if you can get through this this quagmire here. You do have open area over here if you want if you want to start moving those faster units. So, depending on your play style, you might want to actually go. Well, I guess my ultimately what I'm saying is you might actually want to c at least consider advanced mech or heavy armor for Japan based on your play style. Just as a thought. And advanced artillery, if you want to use advanced, uh, fast moving, advanced self propelled artillery. But advanced artillery is still a pretty good one if you want to just, if you want to just increase your overall firepower on the ground. So that, now we'll move on from those three. So radar. Um, is this worth it for Japan? Uh, there are absolutely reasons Japan would want to take this one. Um, they do have two convoys, one here and one that goes all the way down here, uh, and now only two convoys, but each convoy is worth five IPP, and I believe it's the same way on the new map. 
So that's 10 IPP that they could potentially lose. Now this one's a little more easy to defend because it's only these two spots, but you can ki you can kill 10 bucks out of the Japanese uh, economy every turn with uh, uh, hitting this convoy line. And maybe the Japanese player looks at how the Japanese player is building his fleet, or even the FEC in Anzac, uh, because I know in version 3, uh, there were people who would just drop a sub a turn with Anzac. I mean, hell, even I've done that. Just a sub a turn and just harass the hell out of Japan. Either sink ships that are out by, their, by themselves or, or hit these convoy lines. So you might want to take it to help defend your, your convoys. Um <clears throat> As far as scrambling air units, and a lot of the same things that I've talked about with Germany apply here. I don't generally see a, you know more than three fighters in a particular air base zone anyway very often. I mean, I'm sure it can happen. And, and if you're going uh, balls of the wall having to defend Japan, you might just drop five fighters in Tokyo and, and just to have them there. And so you want the ability to scramble all of them. Also, you've got a lot of major ports, and not just in Japan, but there's a lot of major ports down throughout this area. And so the ability to go into port and then scramble out as needed and send everything out may be crucial later on in the war, as I'm, you know, assuming that America is, is you know, breathing down your neck and or the British, the Commonwealth has got its act together and is sending its fleets your way, and, and you want to kind of do this cat and mouse thing and fight on your terms. So yeah, I I think now I have not played that with the the, the scrambling from sea, uh, naval bases very often, but I can totally see that being a thing moving forward uh, in in a very general sense in terms of of something that the Japanese player has to consider. So beyond so yeah, I think that alone is probably going to put this one on the you should consider it in the future uh, until the kind of meta settles and then maybe it maybe it maybe it falls back or maybe it becomes a, a high priority one I, I don't know it's a little hard for me to judge that one right now um shooting down strategic rockets you're probably not going to be hit with strategic rockets very often um they're difficult for america to get over for the u.s to get over there china's probably not going to build any russia's probably going to want to send any they build against germany if they have them and the commonwealth even if they get them, there's probably other things that they want to build in Calcutta and or, uh, well, in, in, the, in India or down in Anzac. Uh, there's probably other things that they, they're going to want to use that factory space for. Yeah, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they, you get rockets and then they start hitting, you know, they, they put them in a position where they can hit you with them. Um, I, I, however, I'm not super worried about that. Uh, fighters able to intercept and scramble from heavy fleet carriers. Now, this is an interesting one right here for Japan because heavy fleet or heavy ship construction is one that Japan may want to may want to go after. Um, so, if you actually have, if you know you're going to get and build heavy fleet carriers, you may ex explicitly, for purposes of being able to use them as a scrambling platform, you may want to get radar. Uh, and plus six modifier to opposing battle cruiser die rolls. Um, the British do have battle cruisers down here, and and, and I know so. Yeah, yeah, it depends on I guess how how much they're harassing you with them. But I, that's I, I mean I certainly wouldn't take radar because of that. Um, and maybe that's more of just a, a, a interesting side note based on how the game is going. So yeah, I think radar is is kind of in a state of flux right now, depending on how the meta, particularly this this scrambling from major naval facilities kind of plays out in the long term. But uh, but I think there's definitely something... Uh, it's definitely one I'm watching closely. Now, ASW. Kind of like... A lot of what I said about Germany, where, yeah, Germany could invest in it, but their, their convoy lines only are a total of five bucks, and maybe they really want to defend them because they don't want to risk having to put out a lot of effort into, into uh, other putting units there to defend them. So they're like, yeah, I'll go for, for anti-submarine warfare. Now, it's kind of an odd thing because Germany's less interested in doing that, but they actually have more tech dice easily than, than Japan. So they could afford to do this if they wanted to. Japan probably wants this a little bit more than Germany because they have you know, convoys that are a little, are definitely worth more and more vulnerable than German convoys, uh, but they have less tech dice to, to 
spend on it. So I don't consider this a high priority for them. Um, in general, not for protecting the convoy lines. Now, but then again, maybe you were playing against uh, a U.S. or a Commonwealth player that you know just loves sub-spam, and you know, you know you're going to be hunting those guys left and right, and you know they're going to be hitting your convoy lines turn after turn after turn. So, yeah, maybe maybe you do want it to help chisel away and help protect your, your, your assets. <laughs> though, one interesting aspect of this, though, is sea planes on map get plus two attack bonus against submarines. Um, again, if you're playing against somebody who really loves their subs and, and you really know you're going to have to put a lot of effort into getting them, you know, maybe this is worth it. I mean, they do start off with one seaplane, but I don't know what the likelihood is of them ever building a second one. Um, you know, so I don't know. I guess you have to really look at your play style as to whether that would be worth it. I, I don't put anti-submarine warfare on a high as a, on a high tier for Japan. Though, uh, though they wouldn't hate having it, like a lot of these texts, it's like, yeah, it's not a high priority, but man, if I could get my hands on it, I'd, I'd certainly take it. So improve factories. Now, I do like this one for Japan. Um, I traditionally have, have usually built a factory down here in Siam, and that allowed me to put at least two units, assuming that I have improved factories, two units down here a turn, which is a, it feels so much better to be able to put units down here much closer to the front where you're more likely to need them. Even if it comes to just reloading, even if let's say India really isn't a huge threat or I'm not even worried about going after India, just to be able to help build this firewall here to keep them at bay and then build Marines to kind of reload the transports and do other things with them, it's nice to have that flexibility. And then Rehi, same thing. Being able to build two units a turn up here, and you can see in this game, this guy built the second factory there. Uh, because it's just, it, it's really nice to be able to put units right there, not just to help go into China and push into China, not just to have this space be able to reload Marines and infantry, but then also to be able to have units ready to deal with Russia if Russia comes into Manchuria. Um, and I have also in other games uh, built a factory in Nanking, again, for a lot of the same reasons. It's just nice to have one more point supply point of production away from the main island to be able to put guys out there. Now, in version four, if J and another thing to consider is if Japan can score its victory objective for holding Southeast Asia, it gets to put down a factory in one of these territories down here. Most likely you're going to put it in Siam. It being the most centralized location. Now, that's a whole other discussion. That's, I kind of like knee jerk. That's probably where I would put it. All, all other factors being relatively the same. But of course, every game plays out a little differently. Um, so again, maybe you don't even want to build it. You know you're going to be able to, you, you're in a position where you're confident you can score that victory objective. So great. You're going to build that factory there and you want to be able to pump two units out of turn. Great. Improved factories works. Now, there now again though this one i completely understand if this one has to hit the cutting room floor quite often in favor of other things like improved construction so improved construction is uh, probably going to be an automatic one for most japanese players now i, I, I don't want to say it all the time because there's different ways to get to your 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 uh, victory objectives but um, not only, so all facilities cost, uh, one less. So of course, if you, if you're going to build facilities, saving money is always a good thing. Uh, be ha and then the ability to pump out bigger, uh, multi-stage ships or facilities quicker just to knock them out, get them out there. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's absolutely a, an excellent option to have on your tool belt. Um, but the fact that all ships cost minus one IPP per stage and this stacks with Keto Butai is huge. That's huge. Um, even if you get this and then you can score Keto Butai, you know, just for a couple turns before maybe the U.S. kind of gets some more ships in the water, you know, that's still, that's a huge saving, sh uh, savings on your capital ships that you're going to be building. Um... And assuming that Japan is going to want to go after that victory point to have uh, more capital ships. And you know what? I cannot remember for the life of me exactly how that's worded. Let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. I think that is absolutely a worthwhile 
use of our time. Uh, Kido Butai. Japan has more undamaged capital sh capital ships in the Pacific than the Allies while at war with the Allies ma with an Allies major power. Each heavy battleship and heavy carrier counts as two. Uh, note ships import do count. Okay, it's good that there's a clarification there. So if you can get to this point, then it's even easier for you to build capital ships. Minus one IPP per stage, and this stacks with improved construction. And it even clarifies that right here. So for a total of minus two IPP per stage per ship. So you know what? Let's actually scroll down here real quick while we're here. So uh, where are we at? So destroyers, you could build a destroyer for five bucks. You can build a light cruiser for seven. You can build a heavy cruiser over two turns for six. Now that's over two turns, otherwise you're paying full boat at ten if you want to put pump it out right away. Battle cruisers are gonna be uh, a total of ten over two turns. And battleships are gonna be uh battleships right now they cost 18 they would only cost 12 over three turns if you're hitting uh keto butai and you've got improved construction so that's really impressive that's a uh a, a, a really or excuse me um sorry no 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 i misspoke there yeah scratch that scratch that i i, I meant to only look at the battleships because it's a keto butai only applies to or wait hold on let me double check something i may have misspoke capital ships i'm sorry Capital ships. I got myself confused. I could edit that out, but you know what? I'm okay leaving it in there because, quite frankly, this is the sort of thing that I like to come across as I'm thinking about the rules. Because if I do a mental stumble now, then hopefully I won't do that mental stumble in a game when it matters. And, and suddenly it's like, oh, man, that's not how that works. Oh, oh, crap, it's not how that works. Oh, no, my plans are screwed up. So, yeah, I, this is why it's fun. It's why it's nice to talk about this stuff ahead of time. But still, not only is improved construction, so back to my original point, improved construction is going to make destroyers 6 and 8 and, and, well, 8 here over 2 turns and 12 here over 2 turns. But your capital ships, our battleships, are only going to be 12 bucks over 3 turns. And, you know, let's say you only get this Kido Butai the first turn, so you save some money on that first turn, and then he manages to splash some more capital ships. Well you can still kind of rush production at that point and kind of go, okay, well, let's, let's, let's get this guy out and, and at least get back in the game and try to start scoring Kido Butai again with other ships that I've got in the queue. So yeah, that's, that's pretty good stuff. And then your heavy battleships are only going to be 15 bucks over, over three turns. That's, that's really, really good. Uh, fleet carriers are only going to be nine. Cause yeah, that's a cap capital ship. Yeah, and heavy fleet carriers are only going to be 12. Now, of course, it takes time to build them. And you may need to just rush the production and pay full boat for it just to be able to, to make sure you stay ahead of Kido Butai. That makes perfect sense. Because not only is Kido Butai, not only are you getting that bonus, it's worth a victory point. You want to make sure you end the game with that victory point. So, yeah, uh, improved construction is, is, I think, for most people, going to be the first go-to for Japan for obvious reasons. Um, Airborne Doctrine. Now, this one is probably pretty good for Japan. It, especially so long as you're, you're building Airborne here in Japan and dropping them off into locations in, in China to help take out China. And then setting yourself up in spaces down here to kind of, uh, as you, you, you uh, leapfrog forward from island to island. Um, the problem is, is, is re re-upping the airborne where are you going to go get more airborne to be able to continue your airborne operations once you start moving away from your factories and and now it obviously if you got a factory down here it becomes a little bit easier if you start island hopping down here and you want to put a factory down there it becomes a little bit easier a place to be able to rebuild the airborne but that's where i see japan kind of sputtering out uh, and having logist a lot of logistical difficulty making sure that they're they're using them every turn. Because if you only get to use them every other turn, or God forbid, every third turn, is it really worth it for you? And I would say that about Airborne in general, not just the Airborne Doctrine. Airborne Doctrine just makes Airborne even better. And it doesn't help that Japan 
doesn't start with a with a transport plane for some reason they don't start with a transport plane um so yeah they right off the bat if they want to use airborne they're gonna have to drop eight bucks to build a transport plane and maybe they do maybe that's completely worth it they see reasons to do it and i i do think there are reasons to do it that are worth it uh for for getting some of these more remote islands out here because it gives you a little more reach and assuming that your aircraft can can go out there drop the guy off and then come back to a safe harbor uh not literally, but, you know, somewhere where the enemy can't get to, as opposed to having to stick your transports out here and putting them in harm's way, then, yeah, there's there's reasons to use airborne uh, for, for island hopping or, or taking the more remote parts of Australia, depending on the circumstances. And so to say airborne aren't useful for Japan is absolutely... I, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it's it's... Logistically, it can be a, difficult for them to use them the way I look at it right now without having actually put a lot of effort into trying it out. So for that reason, I think Airborne Doctrine, for me, would not be a high priority. Now, maybe you see another way to use it. Maybe you see it as a, a way to, you know, constantly reinforce these islands out here uh, with, uh, like, artillery pieces or higher quality stuff. Um, you, you constantly are building it in, on the mainland, and then you're dropping it off and coming home and dropping it off and coming home or something like that. Um you know, I could see that too. Um, but again, I, I haven't tried it. I haven't played with uh, Airborne with Japan before to any major, to really at all. Um, so I would be interesting to see if anybody has any experience with that and how it works for them. So then we have Amphibious Doctrine. So this is probably going to be a, a top tier one for Japan. Because they're going to be island hopping and or coastal attacking probably through most of the game. Um, and there are certainly are situations where you're able to spread out as Japan, take everything you need, and then you're going to do kind of a, an attrition falling back war where you're going to kind of keep America busy and keep whatever Anzac and the FEC do, do busy. And, and you won't have to be doing as much island hopping as you were when you took the islands. So... And if you've got a particular strategy that's like that, where it's like, well, we grab everything, and then once we get it, we don't have to generally retake it. They have to come and take it from us. Well, maybe maybe you deprioritize this one. Uh, I could see some argument there. But I'm going to guess that most games, Japanese players want to be able to have uh, the ability to drop units wherever they need them, whenever they need them, en masse, in force, to win the battle. And that's where Amphibious Doctrine really is good because of, you know, Marine, not only does it make your Marines better and you're still, it, so it gives Japan a reason to continue to build Marines every turn. So you've got Marines and, and that extra plus one attack from the assault transports and assault transports. So all land units can participate first round of combat. I mean, absolutely doubles your, you know, doubles, if not sometimes triples your firepower right off the bat uh, on that first round uh, of combat. So yeah, these are really good. This is really desirable for Japan. Heavy armor, I already talked about. Jet fighters, this one's not bad for Japan, especially, you know, if you want to have better quality aircraft. How often they actually get to intercept, though, depends a lot on your American player and wh whether or not they're going to go uh, whole hog on, on some sort of uh, strategic bombing campaign against the home islands but they need to have some sort of safe port close to the home islands to do that. And I think, I, I don't know whether that's practical. Uh, so jet fighters are probably going to be more about their punch and their, their, their attack and defense stats. Uh, and those are solid. And, you know, again, just like, uh, especially if you're somebody who likes quali quality over quantity, yeah, okay, you know, that makes sense. And uh, maybe you start, you once you get this, you start building these guys, but you start swapping them out with the, fighters you have on the carriers and you bring the fighters that were on the carriers and you bring them back to the home islands or, or put them in other areas for, for, for uh, purposes. But you, you all, you always make sure that your jet fighters are on the carriers to maximize the firepower of the fleet. If it ever gets into a fleet engagement. And I could see, I could see playing Japan like that too, if you get jet fighters. So you've always got high, you know, you always are outclassing Hopefully, if I'm assuming the U.S. doesn't have, yeah, I'm assuming the U.S. is going to go after jet fighters at some point too. But if you can get them and put them where you need them first, uh, and they're coming after you, 
you know, you can, again, that helps you kind of set the stage and put your pieces in an area that is, is more advantageous uh, and put your firepower where you want it better. So jet, jet fighters are good. They're just good all around. Um, but if you're not somebody who favors an Air Force, then, yeah, this, you know, and you, you, you prefer planes, or, I'm uh, sorry, ships over uh, carriers and aircraft, yeah, maybe jet fighters just doesn't do it for you. That, that, that makes sense, too. Long-range aircraft. Yeah, this is going to be another high priority for Japan, without a doubt. Uh, now, you could argue that that is a... Now, again, long-range aircraft hits on an 8, um, whereas Amphibious Doctrine and uh, improved, construction, or, yeah, improved Construction hit on 7s. So the Japanese player may have to ask themselves, what do I want to risk... You know, do I, do I want to get the easier ones first, or do I want to go for the harder one first and then try to follow up with the easier ones? But long-range aircraft is definitely a high priority for Japan because they want to be able to reach out and touch people with their aircraft. It's Especially if you can get this one before you use your sneak attack. Um, you know, it just makes that all that much better to bring in all that firepower wherever you want it, whenever you want it. Um, and, and that's the biggest boon of this particular uh, tech for them. It's just all the aircraft, every aircraft they have just gets one plus one movement. And, and that's just so useful. Of course, seaplanes are seaplane bases, sure, if you've got a sub hunting. And medium bombers game plus one map, well, sure. Uh, I don't, I honestly don't see Japan build many medium bombers in the games I've played uh, for various reasons. I, they absolutely could, but, you know, but this is the big one. It's just being able to go one space further with all your aircraft, all your fighters, all your attack uh, craft is just just opens up a whole new layer of possibilities for Japan uh, and, and their fleet uh, in general. So, yeah, that's definitely a high priority one. Advanced subs. So, this isn't terrible for Japan. Um, they are better than regular subs on their stats. And if you have improved construction, they only cost six. So, and they, you know, it, it, Maybe you want them just to have them as roving packs to harass the U.S. or harass the Commonwealth. Uh, and you just, you know, and I know some Japanese players just like to build subs and then keep them around there as, as, as kind of like unofficial wolf packs. Not like the, not for this purpose, but, you know, attack a small fleet with four or five subs just to tear it up. Um, it's, and it's, that's a completely reasonable option. And if you're somebody who really enjoys that, then maybe advanced subs work well for you. Uh, I don't put this as a high priority. Japan does not do a lot of convoy raiding. Uh, the convoys, they certainly do do convoy raiding. The convoys down here, though, for Anzac is only $2. For FEC, it is only um, $3? Yeah, $3. Now, they can come over here and hit the, the British for another one. And I've had absolutely some uh, Japanese submarines come over here and help raid over here. But for them to do that, that's, you know, and, and to start hitting the really valuable lines up here, you know, they got to they gotta travel quite a bit. And I, as the German player, have sent my battle cruiser down here. And so the Japanese player sent a sub over here to kind of help offset that uh, when the war broke out. Uh, you can actually, I think that was it, this one I was doing. But my point being that, um, you know, Japan can raid, but it's not something that is a high priority for them. And, of course, they can hit this American one if they haven't uh, taken out the Philippines yet. But once the Philippines goes, this isn't a viable uh, target. But they are harder to sink um, in general because you've got to have, because you can't pair them with destroyers. You, you have to have a, a aircraft on map. And so for that purpose alone, uh, maybe you like that stealth aspect to be able to run around and, and kind of harass the enemy on the, on the edges. I get that. I still don't put it as a high priority, but maybe you've had better experience with that one. Large ship construction. So large ship construction is probably a good one. I, I, I think it's a good one for Japan, but I don't know whether I put it at a, at a high priority. For uh, the same reasons, I don't put. I, I I don't think there's any nation I put large ship construction as a high priority. And the biggest reason is that it just, you've got to get the tech and then you have to spend time building it. And it's a, it hits on an eight, 
So, you know, I think it's easiest for the United States to get it consistently and then they'll take advantage of it. Great. Now, what is the benefit of this? Well, the benefit is just one hell of a battleship. And these fleet carriers are fantastic for purposes of, of concentrating your firepower and having three fighters, let alone maybe you got three jet fighters on there. Well, that's quite a task force. Um, so it is a good one. Now, it's better for Japan because of Kido Butai. Every, each one of these counts as two for purposes of uh, matching or exceeding the U.S. capital ships out in the Pacific. So, but again, you still got to get the tech, then you got to build the ship. Um, is it better to just, from the very beginning, just go for improved construction and then get Kido Butai as soon as you can and then just use those, just build regular battleships back to back or however, rather than trying to put in the extra effort to get some of these, these heavy battleships and uh, heavy fleet carriers put in the water. I don't know. I haven't done the math on that, and I haven't tried it. So maybe somebody can give me some input as to whether it was very successful or a complete waste of time, and they would have been better off just building regular capital ships. And I can see that being kind of a, being an argument against it. It's like, well, you're better off just building regular capital ships in the long run. Um, so I don't know. Well, I, 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 that's one that I'm kind of keeping an eye on. So heavy strategic bombers and strategic rockets, I'm going to kind of talk about in the same breath. Japan does not do a lot of strategic bombing. That does not mean that there is no reason for them to, to, to ever consider it. There absolutely are reasons for them to consider it. There are major ports out here, major shipyard or major dockyards. There are shipyards out here that they may want to damage um, in various spots. There's a shipyard in uh, Calcutta now, you know, and maybe just damaging that every turn is completely worth it. Um, but honestly, maybe you're just better off building medium bombers, sticking them over here and, going, you know, and, and flying them over, bombing it and coming back to, uh, to Siam or wherever. Um, if you want to do that, as opposed to investing all that time into heavy strategic bombers just to be able to do what a medium bomber can do, because you're probably less worried about how much damage you do and just the fact that you're damaging it. And in that sense, a medium bomber is just as good as a heavy strat bomber or a regular strat bomber for that sense. Um, now, it is always nice and it feels good when you roll high on that damage die and it's going to be even more money for them to fix it. But what is your end goal? Is your end goal to make them spend money or to just deny them the ability to build a ship there in their shipyard or whatever the case is? And of course, there is a factory in, in Calcutta. And maybe you do want to bomb that factory. Now, you could get strategic rockets, build one or two here a turn in, uh, assuming you've got a factory here in Siam. Or, yeah, uh, otherwise, if you're going to have to ship them out, I don't know whether it's worth it. Um, but you start putting them here in Siam or building them here in Siam and then you just hit maybe the major port or, or maybe the shipyard in the factory each turn just to keep them damaged so they can't use them just forces them to just kind of either save their money or just build infantry or do something else that they don't want to do so yeah that, there's something to be said about that um now I have seen I have actually in, in this game actually I saw the Russian player actually move his factory from Nova Sabrisk over to here to Cheetah well if he does something like that and you have strategic rockets, well, suddenly he's just moved it into the line of fire. Now, the reason he would want to move it over here is because he wants to be able to start pumping out units to co come keep on reinforcing Man uh, Manchuria. Makes perfect sense. Um, so, I, all that to say, there are arguments for why strategic rockets would be beneficial for Japan to have them. However... Again, are you really going to be using them a whole lot? Or are you better off going for tried and two, true technologies that are really going to, you know, give you yields right away? They're going to give you good yields, good return on your investment right away in a much more dramatic fashion. Yeah, I, I, I think there are far better techs than strategic heavy bombers and strategic rockets, uh, even though I'm trying my best to come up with scenarios where these would be worth it. I still just don't think it's going to be worth it in the long run. <clears throat> Improve logistics. So, double strategic rail moving capacity in all regions. Is that very useful for Japan? Well, 
I think that depends on your game. Now, they do have a strategic objective that allows them to increase their rail capacity uh, if they have all of Manchuria and then the, the money islands down here. And then improved logistics would double that, is I'm assuming how it works. So you would have a rail capacity of four up around, you know, really, these islands don't really, they don't really have rail. But you would have a rail capacity of four on the mainland now. Now, is that worth it for Japan? Well, it's nothing to sneeze at, especially if you own all this coastal territory. And there is rail that runs all the way from, you know, well, there's rail that runs all the way from the Russian border. Uh, let's see. Yep. All the way through here and down into Southeast Asia. Now, I don't believe that that rail line runs. Th now, this rail here does not connect with this rail here. Um, so you would need to have some sort of way to co connect those if, if logistically this is something you need to concern yourself with. Um, and maybe you do. Maybe rapidly moving units from here to here or vice versa really does become important. Or, oh, okay, well, I've left this area here in China a little open right now. Uh, and now here come the CCP and the KMT. KMT, they're ready to counterattack. Well, I'm going to go ahead and now it's time to pull two infantry from up here and two infantry from down here and just put them in the, just the right spot to just stop that. So, yeah, having four rail wouldn't suck. Uh, I'm sure there are absolutely scenarios that some Japanese players could, that you can probably think back to a game right now. Man, if I had four rail in that area on the mainland, I, that would have been really useful. That would have really saved me a lot of headache. Hell, it might have even helped me hold China better or, or solved a lot of problems for me. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. I get that. Um, but is that a reason to go after it in and of itself? Probably not. Now, uh, the other thing here, rail gauges, I... Uh, I'm pretty sure all the rail gauges over here are going to be exactly the same. I think the only areas are going to be Russia and Spain where they're different. Um, now, if Japan, if you've got, a, if you're a Japanese player that wants to go into Russia and loves going into Russia, which I think is a viable option, um, at least it was in version three. I don't know how viable it will be or how good of an idea it will be in version four. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, then, yeah, maybe you do want to consider that at some point. Um, now, I'm not a huge fan of strategic naval movement in general, in terms of it's it's very underwhelming to me. Um, that doesn't mean I won't use it, and, and that it doesn't have its uses. But having plus one strategic naval movement, and maybe you're somebody who's cracked the code and just knows how to squeeze every last inch of benefit out of strategic naval movement, and, and you would just, you're salivating at the thought of having another one on top of you know, the whatever else, you, I think they start at three and then they get one for another victory objective and then maybe they go up to five and maybe you're just like, yes, I want that so much. And you know what, if, if that's the case, I want you to explain to me how that works because I, I genuinely am curious. Um, but, you know, I, I won't dismiss that. The plus one strategic naval movement, that could be really important based on your overall strategy. Uh, if you're able to leverage that every turn. Uh, as far as moving factories, uh, it's got to be home country, and Japan's probably perfectly okay with where their factories are right now, so I don't really see that being that useful. So, but again, all that to say, improved logistics could be absolutely very useful for Japan, but I don't put it at a high priority at this point. Uh, but again, I haven't played with some of this stuff, and that's why I wanted to make these videos now before I get a lot more games under my belt and then I want to revisit it after a couple dozen games or whatever and kind of talk about how I feel uh, differently about stuff, if I feel differently, why I feel differently, uh, and things like that. So, yeah, that's my take on Japan and what text it wants. Um, there's there's a lot of text that they, they would love to have, but there's they really are going to just not going to have that many unless they get really hot on those dice or you really heavily invest in uh, another major factory. Um, so, yeah, there it, it kind of it, 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 it it's it's really <laughs> what's what I'm looking for. It's uh, it's frustrating for Japan in the tech game because, you know, it's sometimes it's just so difficult to get the text for them. And it's so disappointing because they can do so much when they do get their hands on them finally. So, 
But right now, this is when I'm signing off. Feel free to leave messages about uh, something I may have missed or something you uh, want to add that uh, you think is worth considering. And so for right now, signing off from the Think Tank.